Hello, Welsh Forest Focus. It was a point on the road for the Reds as they drew 1-1 at Bournemouth yesterday. We'll discuss the game in full, Joe Worrell's impending departure, a Chris Wood injury and reports for a permanent exit for Remo Freuler in the company of, first of all, TNT Sports commentator and Reds fan Darren Fletcher. Fletcher, good to have you back with us. You well? Yes, mate. Thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed being stood on the gantry in midweek at the City Ground, which is always special for me, despite the result. Uh, yeah, that Arsenal game was a frustration. But uh, yeah, a good point yesterday, I thought. And we'll get into that more. Uh, second guest today is Michael Temple. Temps, good to have you with us. Are you OK? Yeah, I was waiting for a joke there. Fletch got his Craigslist uh, Kreslis read off. I thought you were going to say something disparaging to me. So yeah, I'll just I'll just take uh, take a name check. That's fine. Well, we've said a lot of disparaging stuff to you over the, <laughs> over the last few years. So we can let you go. Don't worry. Um, kick us off, Temps, just in terms of general thoughts. I mean, was it a good point? Uh, I suppose the big question I thought it was. Did you think it was? It is a good point. Any point on the road is a good point. I can just see what Nuno's done. He's just he's, he's given that belief back, hasn't he? He's given us some expressive freedom, albeit not so much in the last 12 minutes when we were pressing with um, with the man advantage. But I can I can see what he's done. He's changed the mindset. He's he's picked a team with with two wingers there and Gibbs White in the hole, which I've been calling for for a, uh, a long time, which is always going to create chances. He just took the shackles off a bit. So I think that we are going to have more variety in our results now. I think we're equipped to, to, to win on the road. Uh, but when you don't, you've got to scrap for a, for a point. That was a good point. I think we could have lost momentum given the movement of the teams around us if we'd have come out of there with nothing. So, yeah, I was a, I was a happy fan at the full-time whistle. I suppose, Fletch, Bournemouth have viewed through this lens that to me is a bit inaccurate now. They're, they're having a really good season after a pretty rough start. I mean, like Temp said, any point in the road is a good point. But particularly when you view Bournemouth through uh, how well they've played and we've seen how good they are against us. You know, we just can't beat them normally. So I, I was much more positive than negative. What about you? There was a few things that stood out for me yesterday. Um, the first one, there was a statistic partway through the game that showed that Forrest had had 55% possession to that point. And that is completely alien to a Forest performance away from home. That is such a difference that has come in since the new manager arrived. A different style of play, a more progressive way that Temps just, has just spoken about. And all the Forest fans I bump into use this phrase, playing with a handbrake off. And they did it away from home as well. I think the shape that he employs now, the 4-2-3-1, if you would have done a straw poll at the city ground, if people who watch Forest, they would have said for a while that that looked like the ideal position based on the personnel that we have to get the best out of Morgan Gibbs-White and others. Um, so I like that. But I think the fact that they're now going away from home and they're able to control the game to a certain extent or a large extent yesterday in certain phases is very encouraging. Um, the set piece was a really good set piece. The goal, I think, was pretty unavoidable. But I think after that, they cope with it um, fairly well. Um, and I, I just think if you're going to do the eye test and you look at that Bournemouth team compared to the Forest team, and let's not forget yesterday, that was a Forest team minus some key starting players. I think in an ideal world, M Musa Niakate starts next to Murillo. I think that's the best central defensive pair, despite the fact that Omar Bamadeli's played well in there since he's been in the team. I think Sangari in central midfield is probably going to be a fixture at the back of it all when he's back from AFCON. And Taiwo and Ilanga were clearly still short of sharpness and, and genuine match fitness. And you could see that by their performance. So there's better to come from that Forest team. But I thought they looked significantly better as a group yesterday with the absentees compared to Bournemouth. So I think that while people are nervous about the league position and, and the potential of a points deduction and what that might mean moving forward, I think if you took that away and just looked at progress made since Nuno came in and his ability to shape the team the way that he wants it, you'd have to be encouraged, I think, to this point because the results speak for themselves. They're scoring goals with more regularity. They're better away from home. Um, and, and, and I just think that, that, that the signs are pointing upwards now rather than down. And I, and I think it, it, it's trending in the right direction. I think Fletch is right about the goal as well, Temps, isn't he? Like We are bad at defending set pieces generally this season, but that was a, a good delivery. And I think someone ran across Nico and it, that must be really hard to defend. And then thereafter, uh, generally I thought our response was really good, but the way we defended set pieces for the rest of the game was probably as good as I've seen this season. Is that fair? If you're being hypercritical, probably a bit more of a, an aggressive jump from Nico. I, I thought he kind of shrunk into his shoulders a little bit, but that's that's not his game, really, is it? So yeah, credit credit them for for doing what they what they did. But we re we responded. We we didn't get 
down about that. Can I give you my love letter to Murillo now? Or do you want that in a little bit? Uh, you can go on to Murillo. We've got, we've got a little Murillo section here, Mark. Can you kick us off on it then? Yeah, I, think, I think I said he's going to be a 60 cap, 60 million pound man. He's a 70 cap, 70 million pound man now for me. I just think he's got all the attributes and everything he needs will come from experience. He's quick, he's hard. He had Solanke in his pocket. He let him know he was there. There was a nice bit of aggression. And then he, he, he added the, the poise on the ball and those, those progressive passes into midfield, into Gibbs White, back to goal, popping off and launching attacks. I just think he's such a well-rounded ball playing left-sided centre-half. That was one of his best performances for Forrest. And I, I feel so heartened by what we can become during this time that he's in the side. He's exceptional yesterday. I would echo everything that Temp said. And I think you, you go as far as to say you can make a genuine case now that he's Forrest's best player already in terms of consistent performances, the little wow factor moments in the game. I watched Mickey van der Ven at the weekend for Tottenham against Everton. I think he's been the best centre-back in the Premier League this season. And the closing speed and the ability to turn a crisis into a positive by the defensive now, the ability to get there, to find the extra gear when you need it, to tackle cleanly when it's essential. He ticks all of those boxes. And I think he's been an absolute revelation. And I think he's also a lesson to any fan um, or any of us who judge a transfer based on how much an individual costs. I've seen a lot of stuff this week saying, oh, the goal is only 5 million. Well, the reality is Murillo was only 10. So there are players out there, if your recruitment and your scouting is good enough, where you've not got to pay over the odds to get a player who can be really effective. So I think we should always judge the player based on what we see from them when they get here, as opposed to how much they cost to bring them here. And the flip side would be the case with Sangari. Big money. Everybody expects him to come in and be a world beater straight away. It's not always the case. So he's been absolutely outstanding. My only concern is enjoy him now because I think people are going to be knocking the door down for him before too long. Bigger clubs than ours, which I don't like to see and I don't want to happen. But it's so difficult to find a centre-back that good in the Premier League that quickly. So I just think he's going to be the apple of a lot of people's eyes before too long. And Forrest, I think, again... When you see what they were able to do with Arel, signing for 10, selling potentially for 30, that's the way the club has to operate. Um, and I think that'll be the same with him. You'll sign him for 10, you'll sell him for multiples of that, and then you'll go again. And I think if that becomes the formula and it becomes a successful formula, then it's going to be exciting to see these players develop. It's going to kick us in the balls every time they get sold. But then we're going to be excited again if the recruitment's right to see the club continue to develop. So I think it's a fascinating situation with him and others at the moment. I think the thing I really like about him is he kind of arrived with the icing on the cake. Like he could do the running with the ball, the, the passing was brilliant. But last couple of games, like the Arsenal game, I know, noticed and you kept noticing commentary flats, like his reading of the play he was brilliant. Yeah. The amount of times he cut off balls into the box. I've got and then to say, I, Bournemouth. Matt, I thought he was the best player on the pitch against Arsenal. I know that, yeah. that Lucy gave. Jesus, man of the match, because he had a goal and an assist, and that's what you do. But I think pound for pound over 90 minutes, the best footballer on the pitch at the City ground on Tuesday night was Murillo in a forest shirt. I, I thought he looked better than Saliba. I thought he looked better than Gabriel on the night. And I'm a massive fan of Saliba, by the way. I think he's got the potential to be the best centre-back in the world. So don't pull me up on that one. But for that night, for that 90 minutes, I think you saw just the, the level he's at. I thought he was brilliant. And the way he reads things, it, 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 the good thing about it is when I watch Thiago Silva play, you see a lot of Brazilian defenders come in and they want to play, which is fine because that's what they're asked to do in Brazil. Um, I look at Thiago Silva. Thiago Silva's everything. He wants to defend. He wants to play. He's a leader. He's vocal. He's, he's, the, he's the total package. As good a central defender as I've seen in the last decade anywhere. And then you look at Murillo and a lot of traits that you see in Thiago Silva are in him the stuff that he likes to do. When Rio first got in the in the big time, when he was at Leeds and maybe the early times at Man United, he was a little bit, I want to do the sexy stuff, but do I want to put my body in the way if I've got to block it? And during the fullness of time under Ferguson, he moulded himself into the best centre-half in the world because he embraced all of that. We've got a young kid here who's come from Corinthians who does that naturally. The defensive aspect of his game is natural. He's happy to put his body in the way. He wants to slide in and make a tackle. He's always thinking when Forrest are in possession where he needs to be in case the transition comes. You never see him really get caught. And when he does get caught, he's got that extra gear that the modern day centre-back needs at the very best have to get you back from a position of weakness to a position of strength. So I look at him and I, and it's, it's, I know it's a very small sample size in the Premier League, 
But I think if anybody's raving about the performance of Van der Ven at Tottenham this season, the way he's played, I think you've got to look at Murillo in a similar sentence because the way he's settled in, in an inferior team, by the way, has been exceptional. Hmm. And the thing about his performance yesterday was it was so different to the Arsenal game because he was like, right, I'm going to go one-on-one -on -one against Solanke, who's really kind of yeah. took him to the cleaners at the city ground, him and everyone in the Forest defence. And Slanky, I think Mark was saying last on our stream afterwards, Slanky didn't have a shot for the first time this season. He wasn't in the game. And he's a top class striker. I suppose attempts, he's still a little, it was that slight question mark over balls in the box. But generally, I mean, like um, Fletch says, he's like, he's probably the first, well, one of the first three names on the team sheet now, isn't he? Yeah, it has to be. I, th I think he'll be deployed increasingly in that, that manner to be the guy that nullifies the biggest threat in the, the opposing forward line. I, I can't say any more than, than, than what Fletcher said there and what I laid out at the start. Exceptional player. Enjoy him while he's here. Let's ho hope he's the reason why we're going to kick on from this point because there's three massive home games coming up. And despite the platitudes we've just given off the back of the Bournemouth result, we expect some points at home after we've um, got this cup tie out of the way. So, yeah, he'll be inked in every single game he's available for and he has so much to contribute between now and the end of the season just on that as well i mean i think a lot of the, the when you look at his strengths i mean the only weakness he has really is he's not got outstanding size has he for a center back so aerially maybe that might be the one area where you say he needs a compliment and i think that's then down to the manager to make sure that he's got one next to him and that also then emphasises the role of the goalkeeper behind him as well in terms of those situations that you've got to say, OK, look, we might need a dominant one in the air next to him and a goalkeeper that's going to be relatively positive because if that, that might be the area where you don't want to find him exposed that he's getting done by six foot four inch centre forwards. So having said that, the modern game, there's far less of that now. So you kind of find the more mobile centre back being fine. And you look at Martinez at Man United at five feet nine, it's not really a, a hindrance to him. So I just think the makeup of the group around him and what they do in certain situations will be something that Nuno will focus on. And let's not forget, he had Connor Cody as a centre-back when he was at Wolves. So he's had a similar sized player in a defensive unit and he knows what to do around him to make sure it's a success. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, really. I, I think they'll find a way to, to make sure that that's not an issue. Last thing on central Fletch, just picking up on something you said earlier. You said you thought near Kate was the longer term uh, yeah. fix there. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, to me, I'm not sure it's quite as open and shut because um, I mean, Omar Bamadeli is coming in, done really well, yeah. and kind of like until he performs badly, you kind of give him the shirt and, and well, let him well, you know, it's, it's, make a mistake. It's, it's opinion, isn't it? And 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 yeah. anybody's opinion is is valid. My, my opinion is that I just love the athleticism and the experience. And the all-round game of, of Nia Carte. I think he's just become such a, a better player in Premier League terms since he came here. And, and I think he's one of those. When, when you said a minute ago about maybe Murillo becomes the player that you put on the best one, and he can do that too, though, can't he? You know, and he likes the physical side of it, things like that. I remember, you know, I've, I've seen him have battles with, with physical strikers since he's been here, and he, he comes out the other side successfully. And I don't necessarily think by going to the Africa Cup of Nations that he should lose the shirt. I don't really think that's his fault either. He's not lost it for, for poor form. I think it's a great situation to have. I just think at this stage, I think if you're picking one of them alongside Murillo, it's great, isn't it? Because you've got two really good ones. You're not really dissatisfied either way. I just think that there's a little bit more to Nia Carte's game, in my opinion, now than there is on Obama Daily. So that, that's the way I would go. But if somebody said, no, you're wrong, we're going to go with, with, with Andrew on Obama Daily, then I would say that's fine too, because it's a good pair. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong. You, you may well be right. I, just right now for me. I, and I thought he picked near Carter yesterday because of Solanke. I, I thought they'd do that because of Solanke and they didn't. And, and those two work really well together. So yeah, maybe he does that. Maybe he says, why change it if it's not broken? Sit there for a bit, Moosey. You shouldn't have gone to Afcon. That that might be the way. That might be the way he goes about it. But I don't think we can lose either way, can we? I think that's a great position to be in. Hey, lads, I've just written down Fletch, and I'm I might be wrong, and you're right. Just just one for the archives there. Let's put that. <laughs> <laughs> that's out of order. I thought, um, that's out of order. I thought Bolly was one. Edit, I mean. Matt, edit that bit out. I don't want that going. In. Don't, don't. <laughs> you can use Tempsey's um, bit, but not my bit. Where I admit that. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought Bolly was the. I was worried we missed Bolly yesterday, so I was so pleased at how we handled Solanke. I thought that was great, uh, really good. But really isn't positive. that brilliant that uh, Bolly wasn't even in that conversation? There's four, mm. four centre backs of a really high standard for a team where they are in the Premier League, and I know that that they get slaughtered for recruitment and 37 players, 40 players, and all, all this kind of thing, but. They've got depth now. You know, if you think about it, they've got depth. Reina coming in gives them depth. Ribeiro coming in gives them depth, provided he's good enough. Bamba Daly coming in gives them depth. They've, they've got depth. And I think that's... When you're in a relegation battle, as they are, the one thing you can't do is run out of players. Everybody's getting giddy at the minute about Luton. And I keep saying, and this, this is my opinion, and again, I might be proved wrong, I don't think you can play to that intense level with a small squad for 38 games and not lose people along the way. They are playing 110% full on every time they get out to close the gap in quality. They're doing it by desire, work, passion, aggression. You can do that in, in periods, five, six games. Then you find a couple get injured or somebody's knackered. And by the end of the season, the tanks are low. And I think that's going to be key at the end of the season because of the way they've got to go about it. And I look at the Everton group. They're only ever two or three inches away from Sean Dyche, exasperated on, on what he can and can't do with his with his group, having to play Dwight McNeil as a central midfielder, having to push Ashley Young as a right winger, as, as he's had to do recently. Those issues don't really factor in at Forest because of the depth. They've got interchangeable pieces. They've got depth right the way across. And I know they could get better in certain areas, and that'll be the plan moving forward. But in terms of numbers and the ability to carry injuries, and in this case, carry AFCON and things like that, it's a real testament to how they've gone about putting the squad together that it's not hit them that hard. And I think by the end of the season, that will be a very significant factor. I think they'll be competitive in terms of who they can pick more often than not because of that debt. Hmm. I do admire Luton. But you're right, they've got that. It's really because they've, they've got a, they know what they are, but they've got Doughty, Barkley and the two strikers. And that kind of puts you in any game uh, in terms of you could, they can score goals, as we saw against Newcastle. But I think you're right about can they do it over 38 games? And I really hope you're right they can't and we'll be all right. Um, Listen, if they do, it'll be a superhuman effort. And I'm not saying they can't, but I'm just saying it would be unlikely, especially when one of the players you're asking to do it game after game is Andros Townsend, and he's not played a an awful lot of football and the body's not what it used to be. You're hoping Ross Barkley can keep this level of form up for the rest of the season. I mean, there's a lot of, look, there's a lot of pieces within that group that they don't know about. So yeah, I, I like it now. And if they carry on like this, they'll stay up. But so, I don't, Forest fans aren't hoping Ross Barkley can continue in this vein because he's making them so competitive. And yeah. what they're going to do is, is raise that threshold to 37, 38 points, wherever it might be make that test so much harder for those in and around that who aspire to tweeze clear but could yet be pinged by the FFP numbers. So whilst and we're... So let, me, let me give you this one now, right? Yeah. If if they get to 37 points, I will take you out for dinner to the restaurant of your choice and pay. There is no way that that team is getting to 37 points. Not in a million years. Not in a million years. But I... I, I, I you right. you've, got it, you've got it here on record. Your choice. My check. Candlelit dinner for two, and I might even stick a Luton shirt on if they get to 37. But I'll, if, if they get to that point, they get to 37 points, I'll take you for dinner. Uh, you can come as well, Matt. I don't know you're looking on the outside. Candlelit dinner. Candle it'll, dinner it'll have to be at the nav because Matt's a corporate machine now. <laughs> well, Nobody I, gets I, free there. I was going to suggest Butlin Skegness and say <laughs> I'll be all right. <laughs> oh, but... yeah, no, forget the bet. We're not going back there again. <laughs> uh, what have Luton got now? 20 points. Yeah. That's another 17 points from 16 games. Interesting. Let me Interesting. ask you this then, boys, on the subject of that number. What do you think the, the percentage is that Forrest get the 37? I think they will. Yeah. I'm more worried whether they're going to get to 43. Easily? No, definitely no. not easily because we're scrapping for everything, aren't we? And, we, and we, we haven't been settled and we've been disjointed and disrupted when those key players have fallen out. We've seen it in recent weeks in the, the absence of Taiwo and Elanga more recently. So the best of Forrest gets us where we want to be. But yeah. in and around those absences, it's an entirely different proposition when, when you've got plucky sides like Luton who yeah. are able to ship four past Newcastle. I just think when you're sat there now with 20 and what they've got 16 games left, if you're a newly promoted team and you average a point a game and get to 38, you're normally absolutely buzzing. And I, So they've got to average better than a point a game the rest of the way to get to 37. Um, 
and there will be a trough as there is a peak at the minute. I think dinner's safe. The flip side of that is if you lose and they don't get to 37, you're paying and I'm choosing. And then you've got to decide whether Davis joins us or not. But that, that's, that's the other side. Yeah, you, you love a Nando's, don't you, Fletch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take that all day long. Yeah, all day. All day. Talking of food outlets, then let's take a quick sponsor, uh, quick word on our sponsor, Trent Navigation. Uh, here's a quick video which uh, outlays the match day experience that you can get at the NAV. So we'll see you in 15 so seconds. Corporate. So corporate. I know. I've got two sponsors this episode. There's a second one coming as well. There you go. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is, this where you, top... is this where you pledge your undying love to Dave Willens and Les and everybody else down there as well? Do you do that? Yeah. Are you... No, I've already done that. I signed a contract in blood and everything. Don't worry. Good lad. <laughs> Let's change gear and talk about the goalkeepers. Then we talked about the centre halves. Uh, attempts so much made of Matt Sells. Our season in his big hands, basically. Uh, well, only one game, so we can't say too much about him. But just initial first impressions were probably everything we we wanted to see. I guess in terms of solidity and composure. Yeah, I would remind you of what I said last week was I wanted a performance from a keeper that we didn't have to talk about. And that's what that was. Did nothing wrong. There was there was nothing spectacular. He wasn't man of the match, was he? But he, he appears to have the things that we've desired for a, a good while now as Forest fans, which is solid hands, a calm head and an ability and a calmness with the ball at his feet. And that was clearly the, the big differentiator between him and Turner when they went to market. Clearly, through a few inquiries out there, he wasn't necessarily the first pick. But I think he's ticking every box for me. Time will tell. Need to see the value he adds over a period of, of 10 or more games. But that's his shirt for the foreseeable. I don't see him being rested against Bristol. I see him inked in for West Ham and Newcastle as well. And if we can come out of that period not talking about a goalkeeper, then he's worth his weight because the, the, the Turner thing had just become untenable. Looked like a, a rabbit in the headlights. And I, I felt like a rabbit in the headlights every time the, the ball was at his feet. So that's a mistake. This one isn't. I'm backing him to uh, to, to be the, the linchpin as we try and stride forwards now. Mm -hmm. What about you, Fletch? It's so early to judge, isn't it? But yeah. it was a change that needed to be made, basically, wasn't it? I, I don't know is the answer because he didn't have anything to do, really. I mean, they played so well in front of him yesterday. I mean, he never really had to do a lot. So... In terms of shot stopping and his, his ability to make saves, we don't know. In fact, he's been capped for Belgium a few times. We'll tell you that he's got something about him. I just thought the way he, the way he strikes the ball with his feet tells you that he's very competent in that area and he strikes it differently than either of the other two. So, it, look, it had to happen. They couldn't continue to, to throw points away in that manner. Um, so they've had to make a goalkeeping change. <clears throat> if it's true and they tried to get David De Gea, would I prefer him? Of course. Um, but that didn't happen. They tried for Ramsdale. Would I prefer him? Yes. So I'll be honest, you know, I, I and I don't know a great deal about it, but it has to be a positive if the first signing Rafa Benitez made at Newcastle was him. So he's a good manager, decent track record of signing players. Nuno's a goalkeeper and all the, all the, <clears throat> all the stuff coming out is that Nuno likes him and Nuno wanted him and, and, and he's somebody that Nuno's happy to work with. So that, also has to be a positive. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to take a, a different game to yesterday before we can absolutely say, yep, yeah, he's the one, we're going to be fine, but just because of what he didn't have to do. But everything he did do yesterday, I agree with Temps, he did it perfectly well. And, and it was the first time in a long time I wasn't petrified every time the ball went anywhere near the box. The guys are rightly telling me in the comments that he's ineligible for the for the Bristol game. So we will have to see 90 minutes more of Matt Turner. But I don't think that's a problem. You're a brave man reading them, Temps. So I'll tell you that, pal. That Bristol game is a bit of a nightmare. Because Yates and Dominguez are suspended as well. And anyone who was ineligible for the first... Or who wasn't uh, on the books for the first game can't play either. So it's going to be an interesting team for, for Wednesday. We'll preview that more tomorrow. But You know yeah. what? Isn't it bonkers, right? It's again this stupid, this stupid game that we love so much. It's just another one. If you're, not on the, if you're not on the books for the first game, you can't play in the second. There's mm. not the AR in this one because it's not on that ground and it's at that ground, but it's in all them ground. I mean, come on. That's what you yeah. that. I can sign ringers on for the semi-final in the not Sunday League. I know. And also, you, you, can, you can play in the Europa League and then move to a Champions League club in January and play in that after Christmas. So God knows why you can't just go and slot in in the FA Cup. 
Um, the last pairing I wanted to talk about uh, on the game for against a couple of specifics was just the midfield two um, temps. It was an interesting one. I thought they both did okay. Oh, well, I thought Dominguez was really good actually without the ball. But did we just lack a bit of control with that pairing? And ultimately, in the end, it'll probably be Sangare that does take the shirt, and then we put a big, big emphasis on him to really do what we hope he can do. I was tempted to say they were a little bit erratic positionally, but I think that's just what goes with Dominguez because, as Flesh has pointed out before, he has this desire to hunt for the ball, and it led to the goal, didn't it? It was him that dispossessed. Um, him that dispossessed in the midfield to, to gain gain that possession that we that we kicked on from Yatesy. I don't know. He's he, again off the back of the way Dominguez plays and the need for everyone to, to go with him to make it an effective press. He finds himself higher up the pitch, and there are a couple of chances first half which he he had a swing at, which which were decent chances, but, but fell to the the wrong man. That's not really his characteristic, is it? But I, I think ultimately Sangari has to succeed for this team to be I mean table side. He has to find the form that we saw before he came in that established the credentials that he has in European football because at this moment in time, as Fletch said at the, at the, at the top of this, he, he's nowhere near fulfilling his potential. Ryan Yates is fulfilling his potential and I think we're getting honest performances from Nico Dominguez as well. But those places are, are, are under threat, even in the absence of Mangala, because they're, they're not uh, in possession of quite the same technical and physical attributes that Sangare has He's out of the side because of AFCON. He's been out of the side before that because of form. Need him to show what he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I think on that, the, the, the only player that can do that controlling job in midfield now is Sangari. Mangala's gone, has to be him. All the others around him have got a different skill set. Um, nobody, nobody keeps the ball like he does. So he has to now go and play there and play well. So... For that, that to work, especially away from home, where you need to control situations and keep the lid on situations more than maybe you do at home in general. Um, I mean, the Ryan Yates thing, I, 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 I'm I, very clear on where I stand with this. I mean, there's, <clears throat> there's a section of the Forest fan base that unless he plays like Zico every week, he's never going to be good enough. And, and people are constantly telling me what he can't do. But there was nobody yesterday better away from home at breaking the game up, winning a free kick, putting his body in the way, getting a whistle blown, stopping Bournemouth playing that way. There's a lot to be said for that. And I tell you, if he came to Forest with an away team and did that, you'd slaughter him over a pint after, but say, I wish there's some of our lads in the team that could do it as well. He's a lot brighter as a footballer than people give him credit, but he has a distinct role in the side. And becoming a Real Mangala is not it. And he'd be the first to tell you. So... I think the blend and balance in there is important. I thought Dominguez was fantastic yesterday in the role that he was in. And I think we're quite lucky because he can play pretty much everywhere apart from centre forward, if you think about it. He can play off the sides. He can play as the six. He can play as the eight. He's a very interchangeable part. He's just a very good midfielder in general. But again, I don't think he'll quite control the base of the midfield as well as Sangari will. I think this is probably the point now where we start to judge Sangari properly because he's coming back from AFCON. He's going to play his position. It's his shirt. There is no doubt. It's now on him. It's not a case of, well, he's having to give Mangala a little bit because he wants to be where he is and vice versa. It's now his position to play and we should theoretically see the best of him from this point. But I think, again, you know, again, there's numbers. You know, Danilo's on the bench yesterday. Um, Sangari's not there. Yates starts with Dominguez. There are others who can slot in and come and do a job. And I think it, the Premier League now, there's so many situations that, that are like horses for courses. I, I follow the NFL a lot and they talk about situational football. And situations occur in games that they have to adapt to. And I think situationally now, Forrest have got players that can do a little bit of this or a bit of that. And it just gives you the opportunity to be different when you need to be. There are going to be games this season where you want Ryan tearing about, smashing into people, being physical, being aggressive, a bundle of energy. There are going to be other games where you want Sangari to put his foot on the ball and pass it to Dominguez and keep it and keep it. And there's going to be other times when you need Danilo to go and run past Taiwo and, and, and nick a goal and, and do things. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think we have to sit down and say, what is the 11? Who are the centre-backs? Who are the central midfield players? I just think we're in a situation now where we've got players with different skill sets that should really allow us to adapt 
to different situations, both before the match and in game, in terms of what the starting lineup has to become as the score changes and the situation changes. So I thought they did well yesterday. I thought, I thought the midfield was fine yesterday. There is one other player, and Fletcher's going to drive to my house and absolutely smash my car up for, for this, I suspect. But there is one other player I think could have done all right in this team. I think Remo Freuler could have done all right in this Nuno team sitting at yeah. the base of the midfield. Couldn't agree more. Actually suits him a lot better, doesn't it, really? Couldn't agree more. He was, at, he was putting a position. Remo Freuler's a good footballer. I, I said when he came, I watched him play for Atalanta at Anfield. He was the best midfield player on the pitch. I watched him play for Switzerland. He's often the best midfield player in that game. He came to Forest and was asked to do something that's not him. So that's not on Remo Freuler. But Remo Freuler didn't fit. And Remo Freuler had to go. And Remo Freuler probably shouldn't have played as many games as he did based on what he was being asked to do. But Remo Freuler sitting at the back of that midfield now in a 4-2-3-1 where you've got one slightly deeper, I think he'd be absolutely perfect. So, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. But I raise that because it sounds like his move to Bologna has been made official for €4 yeah. million. Uh, euros. So, you know, the, he's moved on, fair enough. But I think you're right, we do have some some depth there. Um, the, we should talk about a couple of instances in the game terms, notably the red card and the red card that wasn't. Um, I mean, Cliver was really lucky to stay on and then get subbed off. But then I thought the ref got the red card right when a few might have flashed the yellow there and then it goes to VAR or something. What did you make of... Uh, the referees. Was it Rebecca Welch? Sorry, I forgot her name. What did yeah. you make of her at all attempts? She got hammered by the Bournemouth flot for the billing red card, but he, he's tried to injure Callum hudson Doy there. He hasn't tried to stop the break by, by tripping him, which a professional foul, a shirt grab, whatever it might be. He's raked his studs down, down the bottom of his calf into his Achilles, so that's the reason. I think she got it spot on. It's one of those VAR things whereby they wouldn't have overturned a yellow. They wouldn't have overturned a, a red. It, it's it's on the borderline, unfortunately, because of the, the frequency of, of those type of fouls. Every centre midfield is almost entitled to one. Yatesy feels like he's entitled to one in a, in a game. So I'm against the Bournemouth reaction to this. I think she got that one spot on. And if she made a mistake, it was a lenient she showed Clive later in the game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, who, I who's, thought... Who's who's kicked back against it, Temps? The, the red card? Bournemouth gaffer afterwards. Really? Yeah, Bournemouth reaction. Really? Um, it was his, his match of the day quotes were, were about wow. that being too harsh. He said wow. the stadium expected a yellow. But wow. she, you know, she, she was confident and adamant it's, it's, and she got it right. Bournemouth Stadium. No, I agree. Uh, Danny, Murphy, Danny Murphy's absolutely battered Bill in this morning on the radio. Um, I think the ch a challenge like that is designed to do one thing. It's designed to injure the fellow that you're challenging. You can't... The, the fact that Callum didn't re-injure his Achilles tendon in that challenge is is lucky, really. Um, he didn't try He didn't try to trip him, because if you try to trip him, it's a different action with a leg. He tried to stand on the back of his foot to stop him. And if, if, if a challenge carries the consequence of serious injury, then I don't see how you can defend it. I don't care whether it's your first or your 15th. If, if it's that kind of challenge, you can't do it. And if, if they're going to get that kind of challenge out of the game, if they're going to stop situations like that developing, then there's no option but to give him a red card. I, I'm astonished that Iriola has not just come out and said, yeah, got to take the medicine on that one. He shouldn't have done it. The Clybert thing, I just think it showed the inconsistency because Forrest got a yellow card for a similar challenge not long after he got let off for what I thought was the worst of his indiscretions after his yellow. I mean, there were, if, if you're going to get a yellow for persistent fouling, which you do normally, I think he had four um, after the yellow. One of them in particular was a yellow because it broke up an, an attack, it broke up a counterattack. So that, under the letter of the law, that's a yellow. So I think Rebecca Welsh got that wrong. I think she got the billing one right. I think in general play overall, she was fine. But I just think it's this general malaise of officiating in the Premier League at the minute where nobody knows what's happening. I did a couple of games in the week. I was at Liverpool on the Wednesday. Chelsea didn't get two penalties. Paul Tierney was the referee. I mean, this is mad, by the way. Wait till you get this one. So Paul Tierney is the referee. Didn't see either of them as penalties. Both went to VAR, neither given. The one on, on, on Kunku from Van Dijk was an absolute stonewaller. I mean, the other one might have been, but the second one was. The next night, I'm at Molyneux. And Paul Tierney's the VAR now, right? So Casemiro gets a little bit of contact, not much, nowhere near as much as Nkunku had the night before from Van Dyke. gets referred to VAR. And the fellow that didn't see it as a penalty on the pitch the night before gives it as a penalty the night after. 
So we shouldn't really be surprised that there's this scenario where no fan at the moment or commentator, reporter, anybody has any idea the way the officiating is. We used to be able to say to the pundits, well, you should know. You can't say that anymore because nobody's got any idea what's going to come. The latest one is whether you can block a goalkeeper or not. Nobody knows that now. So people are going to start taking their chances. Well, let's block him. We might get it. We might not. And then there's going to be out outcry every time every any goal gets disallowed for it. So they've just generated another grey area. So don't get me started on the officiating. It's just it's just it's rank at the minute across the board. It's so inconsistent. Here's one for you. Would VAR be any worse if we gave that button to the commentator rather than someone who doesn't really know the game? Mate, listen, I, you know what? I wouldn't even want it. Wouldn't even want it. No interest in it. Because <laughs> I tell you what, the way they're officiating it now, I wouldn't know whether to press the button or not. I stand there on the gantry and look at Ali McCoy and go, what do you reckon? And he's, I've got no idea. I just no, think I... you'd get on with it, though. I just, if red button, green button, 20 second yeah. we'll go to Fletch upstairs, yeah. Stonewaller, bang. <laughs> well, I tell you what, Forrest might get a few more points if I was commentating on them. <laughs> that, that might. But I tell you, you know, in, in, in general, what I do enjoy, and I have enjoyed this season, is when I've seen FA Cup ties without video technology i think goal line technology is enough i've said it from day one i don't like it i don't think they're very good at it i don't think they know how to operate it i think it spoils the game and i think the fa cup this season the games that haven't had var have been a better watch and have flowed better than the ones that have so i i think they've got the perfect illustration of watching the game played the old-fashioned way and the new way the old-fashioned way still seems better for the consumer in my opinion yeah yeah, I think that you're right about the FA Cup. I think that's that Ipswich um, Mason game where yeah. the second goal probably would have been ruled out by VAR for some innocuous foul in the halfway line, and therefore it kills the kills the emotion. So I have enjoyed the FA Cup a lot more. In fact, I've enjoyed, enjoyed the FA Cup in general this season. To be fair, um, last one on the game. Do you think Kemp's? I, I kind of feel like if Tywo was fully fit and Ilanga was fully fit, I think we might have won the game because I thought Tywo had Sanessi's number. I thought Lloyd Kelly actually had a really good game. I think he's a good player against Salanga. But if Taiwo just had that a bit more match sharpness, do you think we might have won that one? He wasn't technically sharp, was he, first half? So two examples. There's the, the, the through ball, where he's on everything white. We created the space, uh, fired him through, left foot swinger, no power. And then the one where he opened his body up, went right peg with the inside of the foot, didn't generate any power after absolutely toasting his man. So we, we need that sharpness back quick it only comes from playing games and that's what he's doing now it sounds like Chris Wood's out for a while so it's Taiwo for as many minutes as we can eke out of him before we go to to plan C which might be Ribeiro who from a from a blind spot may or may not be ready I have no idea what that what that kid is but yeah 100% they were the kind of chances that Taiwo was was taking when he was in his best form he still showed the acceleration and the guard to get past the defender but in those two instances, first half, the, the finish wasn't there. And, and they were, there were technical reasons for that in, in both instances. So, yeah, I'd agree. Uh, early goal helps. We don't do well from behind. We've surrendered some leads as well. But it's an entirely different game on the road. And you can pull certain levers to make yourself more solid if you find yourself ahead in the game. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's something that Nuno's got to work out. I, I, I thought they had enough ball in the final third yesterday to generate more work for Neto than they did they got around the box a lot and then didn't have either the ability to get the ball into a position where it could lead to a clear chance or a reluctance to do so I'm not quite sure which it was but they had enough final third entries to to, to generate more than they did I think Taiwo is always going to be the player that we saw yesterday on a going day he's going to look as, as good as a lot in the Premier League and on an off day or when he's not quite sharp, he's going to look like there's a lot missing from his game. I just think that's him. What he has got is a remarkable ability to be in the right place at the right time. And that's there's a lot to be said for that for a centre forward. Um, but I think that's 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 the next issue for Nuno, isn't it? How does he turn that, that final third possession into genuine goal scoring opportunities? Because there weren't that many yesterday. Neto wasn't that busy, was he? Um, so I, I think that's a problem. I tell you what's what's interesting moving forward. All of a sudden, Forrest have only ever, ever really had one genuine number 10 in Gibbs White. So if you're going to play with that position, it's him. But Gio Reyna can do that as well now. So and you can make a case that Reyna's best position is as a 10. He's the best plays, best football we've seen him play at Dortmund is as a 10. 
So it gives you the opportunity then to maybe not play Morgan as a 10. It gives you a chance to play Rainer there. It gives you the opportunity to play with two 10s. Some, some teams try that. Some, some teams do that. But it gives you a lot more flexibility. I thought I'd like to see him given a chance in his position because th there was so much hype about him when he got in the Dortmund team. By his own admission, he's never really got to the level that he maybe should be at by now. That, that, that might be partly down to him, but partly down to the fact they've got some really good players around him occupying those positions. But he's a player that's played in the Champions League and created goals in the Champions League. So that's a pretty good sample to look at. And I just think it gives them another player in that position. He's flexible across the front line. But if you said, where do you want to play? It's our players are 10, please. But he can play off the sides as well. But it gives you, and it also gives you that ability for, for Gibbs, White and, and Rayner to swap positions, to, to, to interchange, to move around, to make it more difficult for the opposition. So I think the addition of him is going to be real. I'm fascinated by it because he he could be anything, you know, that they he could be anything. And and if if he hits at Forest, um then they they'll have a player on their hands. It's not a guarantee that he will, but I think he's I'm I'm fascinated to see how it does. I, I think it's a I think it's a great move because I think it's a win-win. I, I just don't think you lose from it. It's it's one of those signings where if you get the very best, then you're going blimey, what an acquisition he was in January. So and if, if he doesn't, you've got players that can play his position and you're not really losing anything. Mm. There's certain games, um you know, not every game, but I kind of like to see Morgan play a deeper midfield role. He played against Bournemouth with 10 men. I thought he was great. And, you know, you could play them together with you know, interchanging and, yeah, stuff like that. So, yeah, I think it's all options, isn't it? Like you say, we can't just have 11 players. We need 18 players, really, if we're going to do anything this season. I so also think yeah. that with Morgan, if you did play him deeper, one thing you know, you'll get the work out of him because he's a, he's a workaholic. I mean, he never stops running. So he would out of possession you wouldn't lose anything. A lot of the time you'll play a 10 and stick them deeper and they're fine when they've got the ball. But when, when they haven't, you're thinking, crikey, what are we going to do now? But he's not. He's infectious. He's got a great enthusiasm. So I think you could give him any role in that midfield and he, yeah. he'd embrace it. And he, he would give you the out of possession work that you need as well, which 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 is important. Yeah, actually, I think you could take Dominguez off for Reina and Morgan could be Dominguez for the last 20 minutes. They're not the same player, but, you know, there's there's different permutations there, definitely. Um, let's uh, move away from the match. And there's a few other things discussed before we go. Joe Worrell attempts uh, to Besiktas on loan for a while. I, I feel a bit sad if this is how it ends for him, but I'm not saying this is how it ends for him because I never, you know, Chris Wood's a prime example this season. Players can come back from being maligned. But uh, what's your take on the move in general? Well, I don't know Joe half as well as Fletch does, but I've, I've spent a bit of time with him and I think he just strikes me as a honest pro that wants to play football at his football club, but has that maturity to know that the, the, the path is blocked at this moment in time and he, he needs to move elsewhere. So has the move surprised me? Um, not really. I think there's a, a, a level there, isn't there, where it's, it's, it's intense. There's, there's Champions League possibilities at that, at that club. It's a competitive league. And he'll, he'll, he'll fit in really well. He doesn't want to be a professional football trainer that warms up for games and then sits and watches them from the bench, graphs six days a week, drives up and down the country, doesn't get the minutes. And that's the situation that he found himself at Forest. So proud of Joe for not being a Harry Arter type, for ringing his agent, making something happen and getting himself on a football pitch because with his mindset and at his age, that's exactly where he needs to be. Yeah, I mean, Fletch, we spent the first 15 minutes of the show bigging up Murillo, bigging up Bolly, Omar Bermadeli, near Kate. Uh, it, Joe was in a tough situation and potentially it's a great move for him in the short term. And then you kind of review it in the summer, I guess. Yeah, look, it's, it's a loan until the end of the season. Um, he went over there yesterday and watched them play. Got absorbed in the madness of a Besiktas home game, which is which is quite an experience in general. I think when you sit and watch them, it makes your mind up one way or the other. I think this will be brilliant. Or you think, get me out of here on the next plane. This is mad. So, um, look, I, I don't think I don't think this is this is what Joe wants. Joe wants to be a Forest player. It's his club. Came through the academy. Nottingham born and bred. In an ideal world, he'd be the starting captain in a, in a red shirt for the foreseeable future. Um, but as Temp says, he's not the kind of character who can just sit there and take a paycheck. I don't think he's put together that way, which I think is a 
is a, is a mark of him as a man. It's why he was the captain in the first place because he's that kind of character. So he, he wants to get out there and, and and earn his wages and 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 not be not be kind of a weight hanging around someone's neck in the background, which is what you tend to be when you're the club captain. And I just, I just don't think it's a situation that, that that works particularly well. So I'm proud of him for doing what he's done. Doesn't mean he doesn't care passionately about Forest. He does, and I think if 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 he could if he could pick his future. He'd come back and be the starting centre back in the Premier League with the armband on for his hometown club next season. So, um, yeah, but I, I, I and I think as well. I mean, I, I've not not really spoken too much about this, but I think the whole way that he was treated um, prior to the new manager coming in certainly left a, a sour taste in, in in my mouth. I just don't think that. I think there are certain players that need to be treated that way. Certain characters where. You've got to teach them a lesson or whatever it is. And we all know about who they are and the kind of characters they are. That's not him. I mean, Temps knows him well enough to know that that's not him. There aren't two Joes. There's one Joe. He's, he's the same guy with everybody. And and the way he was treated, I think, hurt him. I think he found it hard. I think he found it difficult to keep his mouth shut. But he did, which was a testament to him. If it was me in that position, I would have gone berserk, I think. But... To be told to train on your own and, and things like that and, and not be part of it and pulled here, pulled there, kind of been, been made out to be something that you're not. I just think it was unnecessary and wrong. And I, I'm, I'm sad for that. And I think that if there are Forest fans out there that think that's the case, then my understanding of it is not. And I think that all, all the lad does is care passionately about his club and all his... <laughs> I, I I just wish it hadn't finished like this for him because I know it bothers him, it hurts him and it hurts him a lot. And I think that if he does get back to the city ground in any way, shape or form, I'd like to think that the Forest fans would give him the ovation that he'd like. I wouldn't say he deserves because I don't think he'd say I deserve that. He wouldn't. He's not that kind of bloke, but I think he'd like it. There's a difference between walking back in the ground and hoping you get a nice ovation because you're a genuine guy and walking back through the door thinking this lot better applaud me because I got promoted. He, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be like that, but he'd like it. It mean a lot to him. Um, mm. And positivity from the fan base right now would mean a lot to him. Um, yeah. Yeah. As he's, as he's, as he's mate and I am his mate. I make no bones about it. I, 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 uh, I wish it, I wish it was different for him. And, and if you sat him down in a room and give him the, the honesty test, he'd say the same. I suppose um, it's like the turnover, not the turnover players, but the connection with the players is always important. I know people make uh, laugh at this a bit, Temps, but to have Worrell, Yates, Brennan, that kind of core of Nottingham lads, it is a good thing. It's a, a bit, is it a shame that Yates is the last last man standing from the playoff final? Apart from Toffler, who's in the other shirt, but uh, are you bothered about that or not? It's the reality of our levels, the reality of our times, isn't it? Again, ideally, you would have Brennan Johnson, Joe and Yates being the spine and being the lightning rod for the fans. But you have to progress. You have to move on. They know that in different circumstances, Joe, Joe and Brennan uh, have had to leave um, the, the, the football club. I understand why. Of, of course, Yates will be a court hero and will be, will, will be forgiven for his misgivings in a way that a player signed from overseas wouldn't be and I do think that's important but it's idealistic and the Premier League's brutal and it, it can't be a guiding principle we have the same debate here we, we'd love to have a team full of you know Nottinghamshire born lads playing for Nottinghamshire but our county's one sixth of the size of of Yorkshire so you, you have to you have to go outside we want to compete we want to stay in the Premier League we want to be here we want a fruitful academy as well and we want lads to continue to come through but the reality of being at this level is you have to make brutal decisions that don't take into account, is he nice, does he live around the corner? Mm, true. Uh, let's sweep up a few other bits. But before we do that, I said to Fletcher earlier, we do have a second sponsor for the episode. Look at this. Absolutely. Cool. Oh, I mean, Tim's anyway. getting a slice of this as well. Are we getting Surely. a slice? Surely. We get a, we get a slice, Tim, to this. I, I think so. Has money reached your account yet? No, it keeps bouncing. <laughs> no, it will, yeah. <laughs> No alert. Right, I'll... <laughs> Second sponsor for this episode uh, is a company called Broodbacker. So they're a local business owned by a big Forest fan. Uh, and they, they, this is an unusual business. So they are an acoustic consultancy owned by season ticket holder Danny Baker 
Uh, they're based in Hucknall. So if you're a business who needs any help around noise issues, health and safety law or event planning, get in touch with Brood Backer. A link to the episode, uh, a link to what they do uh, is in the description for their work for this episode in the website. Oh God, I really messed that up. Terrible. Anyway, their link is in the description for this episode. So also, if you're maybe you're a commentator who wants to put professional soundproofing in your room and get rid of all those signed Barcelona shirts and stuff like that, they're the company for you. Right. Uh, I, I might have to give Danny the money back for that. But yeah. Have you thought about becoming a professional voiceover at any stage? <laughs> Someone put in the comments, a member of this stream. I absolutely love how uh, was it, this one of these. I absolutely love how terrible Matt is at doing this podcast. But I think it was meant in an endearing way. I just timed that, and you actually gave Broodbaker significantly more time than you did poor old Dave Willens. Willens is fuming. He's been yeah, on. Already, what's Davis doing? Only three incompetence. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> came from a good place, and me being absolutely terrible at doing live ad reads. I might have to start recording them. I think. Uh, I noticed. Right. Since I saw Prutz drive through the city the other day. Got Broodbaker on the side of his car. So there's obviously sponsored <laughs> Prutz's car. This, this, this <laughs> There's obviously That's different tiers. There's want. different tiers to these podcast contributors now, Fletch. I think we're at the bottom of the pile, pal. We are, mate. We're, we're the Monday crew, aren't we? Just to get the Monday crew on. It's, it's not post-match. It's not pre-match. We've got a couple to do in the week. Get these two on. No, no. When I put the rotor out in the week, it says Monday main, main podcast. So but we're, on, the... we're on a rotor attempt now. We're on a rotor. We're on a rotor. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Rotor. We need to start a union, Fletch. We do. We do. <laughs> we do. <laughs> right. Let's move on for the final five minutes. I must be, I've embarrassed myself enough. Uh, Brandon Aguilera, debut goal against Bristol City. Uh, Temple-esque, I would say, Temps. Do you, want to, do you want to talk us through that one as a man who could have done that himself? Yeah, I think that's how it's been described in the showers, that Aguilera had the shape of a, of a young Mickey Temps. You're not the first person to say that to me. No, it was good composure, wasn't it? I haven't got a left peg like that either. I think the interesting thing in the clip was the, the, the referee's position was horrific. He did everything he could to try and stop Brandon Aguilera stanching that ball by simply getting in the way. So there's a bad bit of ref, and if you want to see that, but it's encouraging that he looks like a player who's going to be a game breaker in the championship. He needs to do that more consistently and perhaps become a little bit stronger, a little bit more consistent if he's going to challenge the likes of Morgan Gibbs White and, and Gio Reyna. But how encouraging is that for a young fella to go on loan to a championship side where it can be brutal and that kind of flair player does have a bullseye on the back of their knees? And to, to score a goal like that, full of admiration for him. Enjoyed his cameos for Forest so far this season. And I, I think he'll be a real impact player in the championship this season. I think he yeah. could be important to them as well, you know, in a players like him, even if they don't hit as a first teamer, they're the kind of players that you send to the championship, they do well, you get a few quid for financial fair play, gets looked after. They're really important players like him. If he does go into the championship and takes the next step. As Temp said, the cameos we've seen this season have been quite impressive. He's a very confident player, very skillful. Um, so you, you can see the potential to be a Premier League player in him. And he's a, he's a full international for Costa Rica. So that tells you a lot. But if he's not, if he goes and has a big impact on these loans, then straight away you're starting to generate people in your squad who people want to buy. And then that helps you with the bigger picture of PSR and, and all that kind of thing. So again, I think it's an important move for them because you know a, a harsh lesson will be learned here if they lose points when the judgment comes out and they've got to then find ways to add to the squad but also bring money in at the same time and people like him having these loans in the championship is is a really good way to do it lots of clubs in the premier league have been doing it for a long time the yeah. most professional part of this podcast is the commenters who within a second of me saying it was a championship loan have rallied on me to say my research is terrible and Bristol are in league one but the point, the point stands. He's going to get game yeah. time. He's going to crack on. And he's at a level where he needs to dominate. And that's fine. When, when kids are growing up, they'll be exposed to levels where they are dominated and allowed to flourish in areas where they've got time on the ball. So, yeah, credit credit for him for taking that chance. Yeah, mm. It's a win-win again for Forrest, isn't it? It's like the Rainer thing. It's a win-win. If he does well on a loan and people want to buy him, it helps you that way. If he does well enough on a loan that you think he can go to the next level, then it's a win-win for you as a club. So, nothing wrong with it whatsoever. 
Yeah, it's a great, like, great level as well. League One, we shouldn't like look down. I mean, you look at like Tyler Walker at Lincoln, Brennan obviously at Lincoln as well. And if you can forge a couple of partnerships with clubs like that, then uh, as Fletch says, a win-win. Last thing to mention is uh, Afcon. Obviously, uh, Ivory Coast just won't get beaten, will they? They just keep scoring these late goals, so they're through again. So we are, we're we're without uh, our players for uh, the Newcastle game as well, because even if they lose in the semis, there's a third, fourth playoff. But then they'll be back for the West Ham game. And the same goes for Olerena, who I've said on the stream a couple of times uh, previously. I just think he's like the underrated one that we're missing. I think he's been, apart from that Fulham disaster, really good at fullback. So one more game, uh, uh, well, one more league game and an FA Cup game, and then they're back for us. Right, it covers all the ground that I wanted to cover today, uh, mostly competently, but apart from a horrific ad read. Uh, but yeah, good stuff. Good to have everyone with us, over 500 people, which is great. Uh, if you haven't subscribed or hit like, do us a favour and uh, do that. That'd be great, as Andy says in the comments here, to hit like. Right, uh, any other business before we depart, Temps? I was just going to say, give Fletch an ad on Insta, because if, if you can bear watching this lifestyle where he travels around Europe watching the, the, the best games going three times a week, you'll also see highlights like him at this, this Butlins weekend, dressed as whoever it was, some obscure 80s character that I'm too young to, to, to recognise. But, yeah, I'll just use my time just to pump Fletcher's social media channels because, you know, he needs a bit of love. Yeah. yeah I'm off to the Super Bowl Fletch. this week, so there'll be some good pictures on there this week. Vegas on Vegas on Thursday for Super Bowl 58. There's nowhere on the planet I'd rather be. So, yeah, mate, follow him after follow him Monday morning. Don't, don't, don't give him the satisfaction of being in Vegas for the Super Bowl this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, looking forward to that. Did I ever tell you the story about the time Gary Bertles fitted a carpet at my house? Did I ever tell you that? <laughs> I need a carpet fitter, though. That's a great shout. <laughs> my, my, I, 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 I'd sooner tell you when he's not here than when he is, and he tends to be on whenever I'm, whenever I'm on. I got off to do a Champions League match, and Lauren was 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 heavily pregnant at the time and had this mad idea that she didn't like the carpet in the bedroom. So she she took the bed down and she she would she'd have been seven and a half, eight months at this point, took the bed down, ripped the carpet up and rang me and said, I've taken this carpet up, don't like it. And I bought a new one. So I said, right. I said, where are you going to sleep tonight? She said, well, I'll have to be on the floor. I said, you can't, you've, you've got to get the bed back up. Well, I don't know how to do it. And I've got no carpet. So she said, I've rung around, I can't find a carpet fitter. And the only person I knew who could fit carpets was Gaz. <laughs> So I called Gaz and said, listen, this is what's happened. Lauren's pregnant. She's ripped the carpet up. We've got bare floorboards. The bed's down. Have you still got your carpet fitting stuff? He said, I'll be there in an hour. So he turned up at the house. I'm away with his knee kicker, as you call it, and all that. And he, he fitted this carpet perfectly, put the bed back up so that Lauren could sleep on the bed with her brand spanking new carpet. Now, when I sold the house, I said to the geezer who came to buy it, are you a Forest fan? He said, yeah. I said, Gary Bertles fitted that carpet in the bedroom. I think it was the selling point. I think that's why the fella bought it. So we could go in the bedroom and know that a double European Cup winner, genuine Forest legend, had fitted the carpet in his bedroom. But that just shows oh, what a wonderful man he is to drop everything and come and roll back the years and fit a carpet in my house. He is a great man. I'm just going to corroborate the story of Lauren because I reckon Fletch ripped that carpet up and then said, can you be a damsel in distress and tell Bertles we're desperate <laughs> that you might do it for free? Yeah, Bertles fitted the carpet in my house. And that, this, was, this was not when he was carpet fitting. This is, this is after we'd worked together. This is only 10 years, well, 13, 14 years ago. This. He, he packed it in, but he got all the same stuff in the, in the garage that he used to use when he was playing for Long Eaton and fitting carpets in general. Oh, he, what a man. And he, by the way, Every time he used to come around the house, he'd go straight upstairs and inspect the carpet to see if it had moved. It was quality control was on point as well. Yeah, you never lose it, apparently. <laughs> what a man indeed. What a man. Right. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with a full preview for the Bristol City game. Someone mentioned in the comments we haven't discussed the Chris Wood injury enough. We'll pick that up tomorrow, don't worry, and look at the ramifications of that. Hopefully we'll get an update from Nuno about how long he's actually out for. That's kind of why I left it a bit today because it was a bit of a cryptic comment. So we'll do that. And then post-match Wednesday, podcast Thursday. I'll put something out on Friday and then it's Newcastle on Saturday. So thanks for everyone's company today. Good to have you with us. Temps, thank you very much. Cheers, fellas. Good to chat. Uh, Fletch, good to have you with us as ever. Always a pleasure. It was. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed Always that. A yeah. Have but a good day, everyone. Short, again, give me a time to shout next time you're short. Main podcast. Monday main podcast on the rotor. Right. <laughs> good day, everyone. Uh, hopefully catch you tomorrow.